So uh, today we'll be saying about leadership. So we have all heard the word leadership. So how do we define it? From a social psychology perspective, leadership is a form of social influence. It is a process actually. So here we have an individual and there is another set of people who this individual influences so that they all together move towards a goal. So that is a very uh, easy way of explaining leadership. So uh, when we uh, talk about social influence, the first things that would come to our mind is compliance and obedience uh, uh, and all those things. But here it is slightly different. It is, it's kind of uh, very much different. So here one individual would, you know, enlist and mobilize the aid of other people. Okay, so one person uh, uh, you know, uh, has the influence on another set of people so that together they reach towards or they can move towards a collective goal. Okay, so there would be one individual that influences the behavior of another individual. It can be one individual, it can be one group that is being influenced. Okay, so when we talk about leadership, there definitely will be a leader and there will be followers. Okay, so uh, we generally don't uh, take compliance or, uh, you know, exercise of power just because one person is powerful, you can influence another person. You can't call that as leadership or I just, uh, you know, uh, listen to your request and I do something. So you can't call that leadership. So it is different. So it is a group process. So mostly if you see uh, leadership in uh, social psychology textbooks and all, you would see it along with uh, group processes or group dynamics. So it is basically a group process. Okay. So it works out in group contexts, uh, you know, uh, more frequently. So uh, you call a leader to be effective when they are successful in setting new goals for other people. So you set some goals, you're able to influence another uh, group of people or another individual with your goals, okay, to make them achieve those goals. So that is when you call an individual an effective leader. Okay, so uh, how do you evaluate leaders? How do you say that, okay, this person is a good leader, that person is not so good or that person is a bad leader? So evaluate uh, leaders based on their character. Some may be nice, some may be, you know, charismatic. Okay, uh, and we evaluate them based on their ethics and morality. Okay, uh, whether they persuade others, whether they're able to change the attitudes of other people, whether they oppress the other people, whether they suppress them, whether they coerce them. So based on that, you can, uh, you know, uh, you can judge them or you can evaluate them. Or even towards, based on the nature, what kind of goals do they set for their followers? So sometimes it may be a very noble cause. Sometimes it might be to save the environment or it can be, you know, uh, to uh, stop starvation or, uh, you know, uh, stop people from uh, being uh, harmed in some manner. Uh, so or it can even be something like engaging in genocide. So it can be anything. So based on all these factors, you may evaluate leadership or, uh, you know, you can say, okay, this a person is having this kind of a goal or this is the way in which this person is making the followers to reach that goal. So based on that, you generally evaluate the leaders. Okay. So there are different ways in which you explain leadership of which the uh, main one is the classic trait approach where you focus on the personality traits of leaders. Okay, so uh, when you hear the word leader, there will be certain names which come to your mind like Gandhi Ji or Nelson Mandela or Stalin, Thatcher. So, you know, they have certain characteristics. They have some, you know, special capabilities that make them different from the rest of the population, right? So, you know, uh, this approach can be called the great person theory. So you link leadership to personality. You say that, okay, these people have certain personality traits which make it easier for them to become leaders. Okay. So we say that, okay, because they have these personality traits, it is easier for them to become leaders or they can be better leaders or more effective leaders than the rest of the population. That is how you explain leadership using the classic trait approach. So, you uh, you know, this uh, theory believes that leadership ability is a constellation of personality attributes. 
okay so we uh, you know these people they have uh, these personality characteristics which uh, you know uh, make them have this charisma or they have that predisposition to lead okay so what are these traits so we generally find that leaders are uh you know they are taller they are healthier they are more attractive they have more self confidence they are more sociable they are more uh, you know have that need for dominance more they are more intelligent they are more talkative the big five dimensions ocean they are also found to be higher among people who have leadership qualities so these are some of the traits which you can associate with leadership okay so there are certain like uh, there is uh, kirkpatrick and lock have said that there are certain characteristics which are uh, associated with successful leadership in the business field so they said that cognitive ability which means uh, if they are intelligent if they are able to process information in a better manner then that uh, correlates well with leadership inner drive so i have this need for achievement i have this ambition i want i have this high energy level that makes me a better leader i have this motivation i have this desire to influence other people i want you know i have this motivation to reach a particular goal to make all my followers to reach that you know collective goal if that leadership motivation is there then that also correlates well with leadership expertise if i'm good at the field whatever the field is it may be psychology or business or uh, whatever okay so whatever your organization is uh, you know focusing on or uh, what they are specializing in or uh, what a uh, specialization or goals are related to if you are good at that if you are an expert in that that helps people who are creative okay people who have the ability to generate original ideas novel ideas people who have a self confidence people who have you know who are who are very uh, clear about their own abilities and their ideas they have faith in themselves integrity okay integrity means they are reliable they are honest they have uh, you know they uh, do what they say you can even include that here or they have an open communication style they're flexible okay they are not very rigid on uh, what they say or you know it's not about uh, just making people follow what you want and not considering them at all you're flexible you're adapting to the needs of the followers so based on the situation you may have to change a little bit so you're willing to do that you're flexible so that is also a trait which we can find among good leaders so uh, that is about the uh you know traits which are there among leaders so there is also a situational perspective okay so we have these uh, you know uh, personality differences individual differences among people who are good leaders and who are not so good at leadership there is also the situation which plays a very important factor okay so uh simon ten he analyzed the outcome of 300 military battles okay so he uh, wanted to find out the situational factors which influence the outcome of the battle which means whether they win or lose so they he also studied the attributes of the leader okay so uh, he found out that leadership reflects tasks or task or situational demands so it's not only about the attributes or the characteristics or the personality traits of the leader the situational demands also had a important role to play so both were important so what do leaders do so how do leaders function that is the next question that we have so lipet and white they had uh, you know they did an experiment where they had after school activities clubs for young boys okay so he, they wanted to find out uh, what the leadership styles were on the group performance the group atmosphere moral effectiveness and all okay so the leaders were actually assistants to the researcher and they were uh, you know they were trained in each leadership style so there are they were autocratic leaders they were democratic leaders and uh, lazy style leaders so the autocratic leaders they uh, gave orders you know they just focused only on the task democratic leaders they were you know discussing the plans uh they asked for the suggestions from the followers they were you know one among the uh, club member 
then we have the laces fire leaders where they left the group okay they just they didn't uh, have much of they didn't intervene much it was just minimal uh, intervention they just you know the group was just functioning that's all they didn't they were very permissive so this is just uh, an overview about what these three terms mean in general uh, you know uh, perspective autocratic leaders are the leaders who give orders to the followers democratic leaders are uh, the ones who use uh, you know uh, uh, style of consultation okay they get consent from the followers they want to get agreement from the followers they consult with their followers for whatever decision they take and then you have the laissez fire leaders where they're not really interested they have this you know style based on disinterest in their followers so uh, coming back to the experiment each club we said that uh, they had leaders who were uh, assistants to the researcher they were assigned to each leadership style okay so for 7 weeks they had one leader and then the confederates were swapped around okay so you know uh, each group was exposed to only one leadership style by three different uh, you know three different people there were three research assistants who were there with the group during three periods but each group each of the three groups were exposed to only one leadership style okay so uh they ruled out the personality explanations so it's not based on the personality traits of the leader it's based on the leadership style so that's why they had this kind of a control they exposed the group to the same leadership style uh shown by three different research associates okay so it was found that the people who were led by an autocratic leader they uh, didn't like the leader much okay the group atmosphere was aggressive dependent self oriented and the productivity was high when the leader was there but low when the leader was absent so they were performing only when the leader was there okay the leader will you know say something or the leader will shout at us or the leader will uh, you know uh, start giving instructions so we'll do it but as soon as the leader just left the place they stopped working so that was how the effect was uh, effect on productivity was for the autocratic group then you have the democratic group they like the leader the group atmosphere was friendly group centered and task oriented and the productivity was high it didn't depend on whether the leader was there or not the productivity was high okay and then you have the laces fire leadership style where they didn't like the leader much the group atmosphere was friendly group centered and play oriented so if you see in democratic it was task oriented whereas in laces fire it was play oriented because uh, nobody really bothered to say that okay you should not play you should do this you should work towards this goal or anything and uh, the productivity was low okay and the productivity in fact it increased in the absence of the leader okay so when the leader was there the productivity was actually low okay when the leader was not there then you know these people they started having taking some self responsibility and they started doing things but the presence of a leader actually uh, you know uh, the absence of the leader only actually increased the productivity okay so this is uh, how leadership style can affect and uh, you know the productivity of a group then you have contingency theories so now we have seen the classic trait approach now we are going to see the contingency theories okay so contingency theories recognize that leadership effectiveness of you know particular leadership behavior or style is contingent on the properties of leadership situation okay so you know the leadership effectiveness of a particular you know style is contingent on the properties of the leadership situation okay so some styles are suited to some situations or tasks than others okay so uh, you know there uh, would be one style that is suitable for a air combat there there would be another style that is suitable for an organization there will be another uh, you know uh, style that would be suitable for a children's group there will be another style that would be suitable for a ballet company or for a nation that is undergoing an economic crisis for each of these situations the style would definitely differ okay so the first contingency theory is fiedler's contingency theories and it is one of the most popular contingency theories it was proposed by fiedler in 1964 so he distinguished between task oriented leaders okay 
and uh, relationship oriented leaders so he according to fiedler there are two types of leaders okay the task oriented leaders are authoritarian they value group success okay and they derive their self esteem from task accomplishment so they would uh, you know have a feeling of self esteem only if they accomplish the task rather than you know they are not bothered whether the group members like them or anything if the task is completed or if they are able to reach their goal then they you know get a lot of self esteem out of that so they value success they value the result they are result oriented the second uh, type of leaders are relationship oriented leaders they are relaxed friendly they value relationships more they are not di non directive they are not very you know uh, people who give out orders and all they are sociable and they gain self esteem from a good uh, relationship that they have with their groups if they have a happy relationship they have a harmonious relationship with their group that makes them feel happy okay so uh, and fiedler he measured leadership style using a least preferred coworkers scale okay so uh, the group members they were asked to uh, rate people as the least preferred coworker okay so this person is the person i would least prefer as a coworker so that is how they uh, wanted to find out leadership okay so uh, if there is a good leader member relationship and a good you know task uh, and uh, you know they are very clear about the task and everything then there is maximal situational control so you have good control over the situation which makes leadership easy actually okay so if there is a poor relationship between the leader and the member or uh, there is uh, you know there is no control over the situation there is poor control that makes leadership difficult okay so you can classify the situational control uh, from 1 to 8 okay so there is a uh, you can move from very high to very low you can see how much situational control is there okay so fiedler's prediction was that people who are low on uh, you know uh, low lpc which means the people who are uh, last uh, low on the least preferred coworker task oriented leaders they would be more effective when the situational control was low okay so here uh, when there is a poor situational control the groups group needs a directive leader okay so you don't have much control over the situation so here the leader has to provide the directions the leader has to give that you know uh, Uh, provide the path or you know provide the direction as to where the group has to go okay so when it was high uh, uh and and when it was high so the group is doing fine so you know you don't really have to worry about the morale and the relationships within the group so high lpc uh, you know relationship oriented leaders they were more effective when the situational control was in between it was not either of the extremes okay so uh, low lpc task oriented leaders were more effective when situational control was either very low or very high relationship oriented leaders were effective when the situational control was you know between the two extremes okay so this is the first contingency theory the second one is the normative decision theory okay so this was proposed by broom and jago in 1988 so they say that you know here uh, it focuses on leadership in group decision making contexts okay so here there are three decision making strategies that they talk about so a leader can adapt any one of these decision making strategies the first one is autocratic okay you don't uh, you know check about the subordinate input and anything you just focusing on uh, you know uh, what decision you want to make that's it okay so consultative is where you you know get the subordinate input okay so but the leader has the uh, authority so the leader only uh, takes the final decision but you just ask you get an uh, you know you get the opinion from the uh, you know the group so that you consult with the group members the third one is group decision making so here the leader and subordinates are equal partners so the subordinates or the followers have an equal say in what decision is taken as the leader so they are equal when it comes to uh, what kind of decision is or what decision is taken in the 
proof. Okay. So, the efficacy of these strategies is contingent on the quality of leader subordinate relationships. So, what kind of a relationship does the leader have with the subordinates? So, that influences how committed and supportive the subordinates are. So, if I have a good rapport with my subordinates, then my subordinates will actually be committed towards whatever I say and they'll be supportive towards the decisions that I make. Okay. And it is also uh, contingent on the task clarity and structure. Okay. So, uh, if there is a good clarity, if there is a good structure on what has to be done, how it has to be done, if all that is very clear, then, uh, you know, uh, it influences how much subordinate input the leader needs. Okay. So, if, it, if the leader himself or herself is not clear about the context or the, you know, structure and anything, then definitely the leader would also require a lot of uh, subordinate input. Okay, so that influences uh, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, strategy the leader would make use of. So, in the decision-making context, autocratic leadership is actually fast. Okay, and effective is if the uh, subordinate commitment and support are high and if the task is clear and well-structured. So, I know uh, what has to be done uh, my subordinates are really committed, the support is high, the task is clear, and that way I can just tell them, okay, so this is what has to be done. So, you know, the autocratic leadership kind of works very well here. When the task is less clear, when there is lack of clarity in the task, or if there is greater, sub we need more of subordinate involvement, you have to go for consultative leadership. You have to consult with them, you have to check with them, and then go on. But you can't uh, just, you know, make them equal partners. But whereas if the subordinates are uh, not committed, group decision making is required because you want to increase the commitment. So if you if, you have, if I make you feel that you are also equally important in the decision making process, then that can uh, help in increasing your commitment levels. It can increase your participation. So in that case, you can go with group decision making. So this is these are the three types, and this is when you actually go with any one of these decision making strategies. Then the third contingency theory is the path goal theory, which was proposed by House in 1996. Okay, so it is a contingency theory. It can also be classified as a uh, transactional leadership theory. Okay, so this uh, theory uh, is based on an assumption that a leader's main function is to motivate the followers by clarifying the paths. Okay, so this is the path or this is the behavior or action that you have to take so that you can reach your goal. So, you know, that is the whole assumption that uh, path goal theory is based on. So, here you actually uh, focus on, uh, you know, two classes of leader behavior. Okay. So, uh, they use the leader behavior description questionnaire to distinguish between the two classes of leader behavior. So, it's, structures where, it's structuring where the leader, direct, leader directs the task-related activities and consideration where the leader addresses the followers' personal and emotional needs. So, you have structuring, which is one class, and consideration, which is the second class. Okay. So, in structuring, the leader directs the task-related activities. So, here in structuring, you are focusing on the task. What, how do you, you know, reach the goal? How do you uh, structure the activity so that uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, get the task done? Whereas an external is consideration where the leader addresses the personal and emotional needs. Okay, so these are the two classes of leader behavior. So, uh, PGT or, or the path goal theory, it predicts that structuring will be effective when followers are unclear about their goals. Okay, so if the followers don't have a, a good clarity about the goals or how to reach them, like this may happen when the task is new or if it is, you know, there is the nature itself is, you know, there is a level of ambiguity or it is difficult. Okay, it's a little uh, more than the, higher than the level that is there um, with the uh, followers. So in all these cases, structuring is, is the method that we can use. Okay, but whereas if the tasks are understood, Structuring is, uh, you know, you can't use structuring much because uh, you can use the consideration there because if you use structuring, it can backfire. Okay. So, you are, uh, you know, actually trying to, uh, you know, uh, interfere too much in a task that is already well understood by the followers. So, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, feedback might come from the followers. So, here you can use consideration. 
Okay, so consideration you can use more when the task is kind of boring or uncomfortable. Okay, so here you're focusing on the emotional needs of the uh, particular uh, group members. But, uh, you know, it can backfire when the followers are already engaged. Suppose, you know, you may think that, you may assume that the task is boring and uh, you need to be considerate, but the followers may actually be engaged and motivated. So in that case, if you engage in consideration, then again, uh, it may backfire. Okay, so they may feel that, okay, this is a little uh, distracting or unnecessary. We don't, we want uh, more of structuring to happen here because we're already motivated. We just need a little more of, you know, direction on what, how the thing has to be done. Okay, or uh, it will be better if we get a little more clarity so that we can sustain the motivation that we already have. Okay, so that is when you use consideration. Okay, so next we are moving on to transactional leadership. So we are done with the three contingency theories of leadership. So now we are moving on to uh, transactional leadership. Okay, so contingency theories or contingency models take both the person and the situation into account. Okay, so it is a top-down view of leadership. So here the workers are, uh, you know, they don't have a very active role. They are inert, passive and faceless creatures. Okay, so uh, Hollander actually wanted to uh, see leadership as a two-way social exchange where there is a mutual and recipro reciprocal influence between a leader and the followers. Okay, so leadership is basically a two-way social exchange according to Hollander. Okay. So, uh, he explains the concept of a transactional leader. Okay, so a transactional leader is somebody who gains compliance and support from the followers by setting clear goals for them. Okay, by offering tangible rewards, by providing assistance, by fulfilling the psychological needs. So, I am giving you all this, but what do I want in exchange? I want an expected level of job performance. Okay, I give you rewards, I set clear goals for you. I give you assistance, whatever assistance that you need. I fulfill all your psychological needs. What do you have to do for me? You have to uh, perform well in the job. I have, I, I would have set this level for you. You have to come to that level. So that is how a transactional leader would work. Okay. So transactional leadership would be effective if the leader is willing and able to reward the subordinates and, you know, to keep up their end of the bargain. Okay. I'm rewarding you. Okay, I am, uh, you know, keeping you motivated so that you give your, uh, you know, best to me in terms of job performance. So that is how transactional leadership works. Next is transformational leadership. Okay, so uh, McGregor, uh, Burns, Bernard Bass and Bill Gates, uh, like they too call Bill Gates and Steve Jobs as transformational leaders. Okay, so... Uh, there is something different when it comes to Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, right? So these people, they were able to motivate others to transcend their personal needs for a common cause. Okay, When there was a you know crisis or when there was a time of change or growth and all, uh, these people, they were able to, you know, uh, move things in the way they wanted things to happen. Right. So uh, they have they had this clear vision about the future and they made other people to join them, you know, to come along with them so that they can realize that vision that they had. So uh, when people are asked about, OK, uh, if I ask you, okay, you would be having certain leaders in mind. So what attributes would you associate with those good leaders? So people generally associate four attributes with uh you know good leaders one is charisma second one is inspirational motivation intellectual stimulation and an individualized consideration of others okay so these are the four attributes that we generally associate with these transformational leaders and these people are also found to be extroverted than the average person so to find out whether people had uh, a transactional or a transformational leadership, uh, Bass actually devised the multi-factor leader personnel or the MLQ. So MLQ is the uh, tool that we can use to uh, find out whether a leader has a transformational uh, style or a transactional style. 
so there are uh, you know basically three components which we uh, you know which we can identify for transformational leadership the first one is individualized consideration okay where i am able to attend to my followers needs abilities and aspirations so that i can you know help these uh, aspirations to uh, be you know remain raised to improve their abilities to satisfy their needs so for that i would uh, go for you know i would uh, use individualized consideration the second one is intellectual stimulation i would challenge the followers basic thinking their assumptions their practices so that they can develop newer and better minds and practices so i just you know i just don't make them stick on to the same uh, thinking styles that they have i make them you know develop new mindsets uh, you know i make them think differently i uh, you know i uh, motivate them to come up with new practices so i intellectually stimulate them and then uh, they would have this charismatic or an inspiring leadership so you know they provide the energy reasoning and sense of urgency that transforms their followers so they have this you know charisma within them or they inspire the followers so uh, you know these are the four uh, characteristics that we uh, you know we discussed in the previous slide the first one is charisma they have this vision they are able to gain the respect trust and confidence of their followers and they make the followers to identify with them they promote that strong identification of the followers okay second one is inspiration where they give these pep talks they you know increase their uh, enthusiasm they make them feel optimistic they arouse emotions among the people they you know make them very emotional and get them to work on things then intellectual stimulation where you make them think or reexamine their thoughts or their values or their assumptions they foster creativity they make them use their intelligence and the fourth one is individualized consideration where you give attention to all the members okay you uh, advise them you give the feedback whenever they need it you understand them and you make them you know uh you you know give the feedback in a way that they can use it for their personal development they you give proper coaching to your uh, group members so that uh, you appreciate them whenever they do something good whenever they don't do something in a proper way or an expected manner you give them the feedback so that they can improve in the next uh, improve the next time that they do it okay so that is about uh, transactional transformational leadership now we are moving on to gender differences okay so uh, is there any gender difference when it comes to leadership so throughout the world if you see uh, leadership roles are mostly uh, there with males okay so nowadays we do have a lot of women in uh, middle management but not much when it comes to senior management and the uh, elite leadership positions so there is a glass ceiling so we wanted to discuss the concept of glass ceiling where you know there is this uh, you know invisible uh, ceiling that prevents them from uh, moving upwards uh, you know past a particular level okay so why does this happen is it because men are more suited for leadership positions not really okay so uh, they have different leadership styles so different contexts may suit uh, you know some contexts may suit men whereas some contexts may suit women okay so if you see women are as effective as leader men when it comes to leadership but uh, they are more transformational participative okay and uh, they are people who are uh, you know who praise their followers for good performance whereas that is not the case when it comes to men okay so we are saying that okay they are they are equally capable but then why why is there this gender gap okay so one explanation is the role congruity theory okay so uh this uh, you know this explanation it argues that there is a greater overlap between the general leader schema and uh, agentic male stereotypes than between the leader schemas and the uh, communal uh, female stereotypes okay so people have this better perception about male leaders okay so the perception that people have that can facilitate or it can uh, you know impede the effective leadership so if all the followers that feel, they feel that okay my schema or my mental framework of leadership it suits better for men 
so they would uh, you know uh, they would listen if uh, it was a male who was uh, who was giving the orders or is giving the instruction so that can definitely uh, you know uh, influence whether the leadership will be effective or not that will influence the kind of approach that the followers will have on that particular leader so role congruity deals with the leader schema or the schema of leader that is there in the minds of the followers another explanation is in terms of the social identity theory okay so here uh, you know there are high salience groups where members identify with male or female leaders okay so if the groups norms are consistent with the members gender stereotypes okay so the people who are having this traditional gender stereotype will endorse a male leader okay so if it is an instrumental norm like if it is a trucking company or if it uh, requires a lot of uh, you know uh, travel or a uh, lot of field work or you know all those things then i would feel that okay a male would be more suitable because i would associate all those things with a male whether uh, whereas if it is a child care group or if it is something which uh, you know uh, requires a very uh, you know uh, emotional approach or uh, things like that or something which requires a very soft approach then i would uh, ex expect a female leader there okay so uh, this is because i have this gender stereotype okay this kind of job is suited for males this is suited for females so that gender stereotype is what makes me feel that okay for this leadership position males are more suitable or for this a uh, kind of a place females are more suitable so you know uh, if the gender stereotype is not very much pronounced pronounced then this effect will not be there and uh, another reason for this gender gap is women uh, don't uh, claim for authority like men okay so men they claim and hold more leadership positions so uh, it's more about whether they really wish to claim or not so once they claim if you see there is not much of a gender difference when it comes to leadership effectiveness okay and the fourth obstacle is lack of motivation so women they don't they are not so hungry for leadership as men okay they are like they don't engage much in self promotion or uh, they don't want to uh, express themselves as coordinators or facilitators or anything so uh it can even be the stereotype threat okay so uh, if i assume this leadership style or this leadership role uh you know what if uh, i am uh, you know uh somebody just you know say something against me or it might lead to kind of a fear of success when it comes to you know a family or uh, your role in a particular organization so they kind of you know don't feel very much very much motivated to lead so lack of motivation is the fourth obstacle when it comes to uh, you know the gender difference in leadership okay so with this we have completed leadership thank you